everybody. Please, please keep telling us uh, where you're from. It's fun to see all the places on the list. We're so delighted to have you all here tonight. I think we'll wait just a minute to let people come onto the link before we begin. It's a lovely day here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. How is it where everyone else is? 81 and clear in Kansas City. Wow. Yeah, about 84 and clear in Mississippi. We had a beautiful breezy day in the 70s here in Northern oh. Virginia. Oh. Just outside of DC. Malika, are you in North Carolina? I am right now. I got to come back, but I drove. So I went through Northern Virginia actually two days ago. So I went <laughs> that hands direction. It was fun. But... We have people tuning in from all over the country, as well as our friend from Poland. And let's see who else is tuning in today. Oh, hey, Canada. <laughs> Lilacs. Oh, yeah. Lilacs in Ottawa. Mm, lovely. Mm. That's pretty. They're gone here, but boy, when I used to work full time, every spring, a house had beautiful lilacs framing the front door. I loved it. <laughs> Just about the only thing blooming in my garden right now are hydrangeas. But... Mm. Our peonies are going. They look very pretty. Mm -hmm. All right. all right. Well, why don't we begin? Welcome, everyone, back to Jane Austen and Company for our final talk of the season, Everyday Science in the Regency. Once again, my name is Anne Ferdig, and I am the co-director for Jane Austen and Company. And tonight, I am joined by my lovely co-hosts, Inga Brody and Susan Allen Ford, as well as our amazing technical director, Malika Amoroso. Yes, it's it's. Uh, I've really enjoyed this series on uh, everyday science in the Regency. How interdisciplinary it's been! Um, and tonight we welcome Julianne Guerrer, uh to talk about the questionable comforts of home cures. Highly questionable, I believe. Cure <laughs> as well as a word, <laughs> but we look forward to it very much. Yes, in fact, um, I got to edit a. a um, an essay on home cures by Julian that was published in Persuasions a few years ago. And I was reading it while somebody else was driving and I had to keep reading it out loud to her because <laughs> it was just so fascinating. So I'm really excited about this, um, this talk. Julian um, is an author, journalist, and food historian. She served as a JASNA board member and is a frequent presenter at JASNA's annual conferences. And in fact, she organized the uh, annual general meeting on persuasion in uh, Kansas City. Uh, Julianne has spoken at Jane Austen's house in Ham or at Jane Austen's house in Hampshire and, and co-presented with US chefs at a Jane Austen literary dinner and a cheese tour of Jane Austen's England, both of which I wish I had been at. Um, her articles have appeared in Persuasions, Texas Studies in Literature and Language, and on LitHub. And recent books include Dining with Jane Austen, which here is, as you can see, a gorgeous book um, full of um, information and recipes and serving suggestions, and Martha Lloyd's household book, the original manuscripts from Jane Austen's Kitchen, which was uh, which is published by the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford. Um, both highly recommended. And thank you. Uh, now I will hand things over to Malika to explain the Q and A. Welcome to YouTube, our streaming platform. If you would like to leave a comment or ask a question, please use the comment feature on the sidebar as you're already doing. We'll collect those questions during the event to ask during the Q&A, but you will need a Google or YouTube account in order to post there. If you don't have one of those, it's okay. Please submit your questions by email to info at janeaustinandco.org, which is on the bottom of your screen. And we'll collect those as well and ask them for you. So no worries and thank you. Thank you so much. And this is just a reminder to everyone watching that this 
talk will be recorded and it will be available immediately following the talk from the same link found in your emails. And without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Julian Gehrer. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I will hit the button from my full screen. There we go. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for that warm introduction. I look forward to sharing this information with the audience and fielding lots of your questions. I do have one request of the audience as I begin. Please imagine the Georgian lady of the house trying to safeguard her family from disease without the benefit of modern medicine. This might help justify some of the extraordinary measures we're about to explore. When we feel sick, we seek relief. And in Jane Austen's time, the first course of treatment for many ailments came from the family's household book. Here, the lady of the house collected medicinal recipes addressing a variety of complaints from colds to consumption. But home remedies from the long 18th century were not equally effective. Some cures promoted physical healing, while others provided only psychological benefit. The ingredients in some recipes could inflict unintended harm, but Jane Austen's family and their contemporaries used home remedies and high hopes for favorable results. The responsibility for gathering medicinal recipes was assigned to the lady of the house long ago. This task and similar female virtues were cataloged in early works, such as Gervaisi Markham's Country Contentments or The English Huswife, published in 1615. And just for reference, this is when James I was on the throne. Markham detailed numerous domestic virtues, including the ordering of great feasts, making cloth, brewing, baking, but his very first chapter set forth a woman's priority as her general knowledge is both in physic and surgery with plain and approved medicines for health of the household. Also, the extraction of excellent oils fit for those purposes. Later books that were likewise marketed to women, and in fact, women sometimes wrote these, such as Eliza Smith's The Complete Housework Wife, published in 1727, shifted their focus to food and drink but supplemented that content with recipes for medicines, salves, and ointments. Smith described these as generally family receipts that have never been made public, excellent in their kind, and approved remedies that have cured when all other means have failed. In 1769, Scottish physician William Buchan published Domestic Medicine, he aimed to share with the public information that was once available only to medical professionals. His writing targeted the literate burgeoning middle classes from whom the poor might perhaps read the benefits of the book at second hand. During the reign of George III, over 80,000 copies of Buckham's book were available in coffee houses, apothecary shops, lending libraries, and for individual sale. His book helped create kind of a parallel flow of published rem remedies alongside those that were passed down from generation to generation within the family. Elements of cures published by Markham, Smith, Buckham, and others can be seen in the cures collected in various household books. Comparing a number of household books from Jane Austen's lifetime with the illnesses mentioned in her letters gives us an understanding of the remedies the Austins and their contemporaries may have used. Excuse me, I'm getting a call. Susan, are we having trouble? Okay, great. Do you want me to start over or just take it from here? Okay, that's great. I'm gonna move my papers to the side and use just the one I'm talking from. Okay. I'm sorry, I've lost my visuals. 
I'm going to go back to my email and get the link. Please be patient. I'm going to log back on. You're still, we can still see you and we can see your visuals. And That's Melissa, do you know what's, what's your call? I lost you, but I'm back now. So if we go on with Dr. Turton's recipe, how's that? Very good. We'll just, we'll just pick up from there. As you might imagine, the most frequently mentioned ailment in Jane Austen's letters is the common cold. I have a cold too, as well as my mother and Martha. Let it be a generous emulation between us, which can get rid of it first. I love how even when she's under the weather, Jane Austen has a sense of humor. The Martha mentioned was Martha Lloyd, Jane's lifelong friend who lived with the Austens beginning in 1806. In this picture of Chawton Cottage, I've put a little letter M beside Martha's bedroom window. In this wing of the house, that's the large bedroom and it's just above the kitchen. Martha compiled her household book over a period of more than 30 years and included, among, among other handy cures, Dr. Turton's receipt for a cold. And you might notice that recipe and receipt are used interchangeably at this time. Dr. William Turton was a contemporary of the Austins. His cures were probably known throughout Hampshire because his name also appears in the Montague family household book. The Montague home of Buller was roughly 40 miles from Cotton Cottage. Although Turton's remedy could not combat the actual cold virus, the ingredients would address its symptoms. Malika, could we have the next slide? Thank you. The prescribed salt of ammoniac actually worked as an anti-inflammatory. Syrup from the tolu balsam tree soothes sore throats and suppressed coughs. And yes, that's the same syrup used in balsamic vinegar. And on the night side of the family, there's a recipe that says to either mix the syrup with vinegar for a salad dressing or to take it by the teaspoonful for a cough. The paragoric elixir is the recipe included, included a bit of powdered opium, which relieved general discomfort and induced sleep. This recipe makes four drafts or doses to be taken during the day and one at night. You can see by the last phrase of the recipe, the paragoric elixir is to be added to just the night dose. So in theory, this is like the 18th century version of today's cold medicine, Dayquil and Nyquil. At one time, at the time of their colds, the women were staying at Jane's brother Henry's house in London, the one on Henrietta Street. If Martha needed any key ingredients for Dr. Turton's cure, she could have just popped round to the local apothecary shop. Happily for Jane, there were also other cures in Martha's book that provided real relief. In a letter from January 1799, Jane mentioned having eye trouble for nearly a week. This complaint in my eye has been a sad bore to me, for I have not been able to read or work in any comfort since Friday. Helpful Martha had a recipe for it a salve for sore eyes that included tutty, a form of zinc oxide used for skin ulcers and eye diseases. The recipe also called for camphor, used topically for swelling and inflammation. Martha and Jane were together in early January for the christening of their nephew, James Edward. And remarkably, that's the same week when Jane's eye trouble began. Surely Martha would have helped out her friend with a, with a cold remedy from her household book. Thanks, Malika. Months later, Jane suffered either continued or renewed affliction, making reference to some form of treatment in the phrase, I find no difficulty in doing my eyes. It may be only coincidence that Jane was treating her eyes in May and that Martha's recipe calls for May butter. Traditionally, a portion of butter was prepared salt-free during the month of May, 
when cows grazed on new grasses. The maid butter was put aside and reserved for medicinal use. Even though Jane was riding miles away from her rural home at Steventon, where Mrs. Austin kept cows, maid butter would have been available on market days in Bath, where Jane was visiting at the time. Many recipes in both Martha's book and the Montague collection contain ingredients with effective properties, such as senna from the leaves of a senna plant and magnesia, that is magnesium sulfate. Those are both found even in today's laxatives. You might know magnesium sulfate by its common name, Epsom salts. Magnesia also worked as an antacid. Perhaps you've even taken Philip's milk of magnesia. In May of 1801, Jane wrote to Sister Cassandra, I suppose you can hear nothing of your magnesia. Perhaps the ingredient is something Cassandra either intended to purchase or inadvertently left behind from her recent stay at Martha's home of Iptrup. That was roughly 15 miles from Steventon. In this recipe for black draft, magnesia and senna are combined with extract from the manna plant that is another natural laxative. Martha received the recipe from Mary Dorothea, wife of Jane's nephew, Edward Knight. When you consider the trio of active ingredients in this remedy, there's really no need to question its effectiveness. To me, one of the most curious cures in Martha's collection has a, Malika, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. To me, one of the most curious remedies in Martha's collection has a very convincing title, a certain cure for a swelled neck. This treatment was meant for a patient suffering from a goiter, an enlargement of the thyroid gland. Happily, this entry is fairly easy to read and you can see that it starts with the day the moon is at full and continues with instructions for every morning till the moon changes and so forth until the moon is at full again. Amidst the recipes for caloric phrasing and lunar-based dosing, it calls for burnt sponge, the ashes of burnt seaweed. Burnt, burnt sponge was first used to treat goiters in ancient Chinese medicine. Although its active ingredient, iodine, was not identified scientifically until 1813, this home remedy would actually address the patient's symptoms. Eventually, doctors learned that goiters were caused by an iodine deficiency. In the last few lines of the recipe, there's some useful sourcing information. It's best to buy the sponge at Apothecaries Hall. This was the London home of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, where members of the trade manufactured and sold medicinal and pharmaceutical products. Martha may have found burnt sponge at apothecaries in larger towns near Chawton, such as Basingstoke or Winchester. Amidst these worthwhile cures, a household book might just as likely include remedies that were useless. Unfortunately, these were not identified as such unless women went back and made notations on their recipes, something I've seen frequently in culinary recipes but rarely with cures. Without some sort of marginal notes, there is little to refute such boasting titles as to make an unparalleled balsam or the famous American receipt for rheumatism or cures labeled excellent or my favorite, infallible. There's an, here's an overly confident title for an easy but certain remedy for consumption or tuberculosis. The only certainty about this particular cure is that it was easy to prepare. It calls for three simple and accessible ingredients. Just think of the lives saved if curing tuberculosis had been so easy. The horn on men. Can I just interrupt quickly? I think the paper is rubbing against your microphone. Okay. Is that Maybe better? just pull it back. Yeah, I think so. I think that might be what's causing the problem. Okay. Thank you. Sure. The whorehound mentioned is an aromatic herb planted in many 18th century gardens. It's, the oil was extracted and used for cough drops, much like those you can buy today on Amazon. As for new milk, 
Note that Jane was born, when Jane was born, the majority of Britons lived an agrarian life. So unless you lived in a larger city, a cow was nearby. For honey, we know that Cassandra kept bees, as many others did. Of course, honey could be purchased at market. These ingredients may have provided brief symptom relief and perhaps a little sustenance, but nothing that could combat the ravaging disease. While Martha Lloyd and the Montague family were adding to their household books, there was a second generation of Ambler women busy collecting home remedies. Their book was started by Elizabeth Ambler, shown in the portrait at the left. She lost her mother at a young age. Her father was frequently ill and her brothers suffered from fits similar to epileptic seizures. So Elizabeth was laser focused on collecting home cures. It is in stark contrast, we can see in Martha Lloyd's book, as well as the Montague book, Martha signaled the focus of her book by inscribing the words culinary interest inside the front cover. Her book, like the Montague book, is about 75% culinary recipes and 25% household preparations and home cures. So you can see how women tailored the contents of their household books to reflect both their interests and their needs. The Ambler descendants lived in Martha's home county of Berkshire, neighboring Jane's Hampshire, and their remedies include similarly exaggerated claims. Both Martha and the Amblers recorded a recipe for a popular cure-all called Daffy's Elixir. There were actually several different medicines called Daffy's Elixir for sale, each claiming to cure a wide range of disorders. The original mixture was developed in 1647 by Leicestershire clergyman, Thomas Daffy. He labeled his formula Elixir Salutis, Latin for Elixir of Health. Martha's version of the recipe was contributed by a Mrs. Davison. That's a relatively common name associated with other recipes in the Ambler book. It's possible that the Lloyds and Amblers knew the same Mrs. Davison or that they received these recipes from sharing content with other women. Sharing recipes was common practice that enabled women to expand their collections, especially if their access to printed books was limited. I can picture women even traveling with their household books so they can exchange recipes with family and friends they're visiting. Like Dr. Turton's recipe, Daffy's elixir contained ingredients that may have addressed the patient's symptoms, but probably did nothing for their actual cause. Of course, the Senna would relieve constipation, while the Ella campaign worked as both an expectorant and a diuretic. Guaiacum is a stimulant and might temporarily flag, perk up the flagging patient, but the dried licorice leaves, spices, and raisins merely added flavor and color to the mixture. The aniseed water, although commonly prescribed as a sleep aid, had little effect. In contrast to many overreaching and overpromising remedies, the ambulers collected a cure with a single targeted purpose. Nurse Payne's receipt for a sore throat in the smallpox promised to address just one particular symptom of the dangerous disease. The preparer could easily find the emetic rock alum at a local apothecary. Alum was commonly used in home pickling and still is. It helps keep vegetables crisp. Mixing the alum with honey and syrup made from mulberries gathered from a garden bush sounds easy, but the quest to find as much dog's white turd as will lay upon a sixpence finely ground probably took some time unless such trophies were collected and saved for future use. A dog produces white feces due to excess calcium in its diet, the result of consuming large quantities of meat and bone. We can only suppose the calcium might somehow strengthen the patient fighting the disease, and we can only hope that the mortar and pestle were thoroughly cleaned before the cook started grinding the spices for the pudding. In the light of modern medicine, such cures sound absolutely absurd, but they speak to the desperation and helplessness that Jane's contemporaries likely felt 
when they, when they were faced with serious illnesses. When Martha was just a girl, her entire family contracted smallpox from a local coachman who entered their home. Charles, the Lloyd's only son, died of the disease at age seven, and daughter Martha was left with significant facial scars. Despite this personal encounter, Martha made no reference to smallpox in her household book. Perhaps the experience overshadowed her faith in home remedies. Perhaps she saw scientific advances closing in on the disease. In November of 1800, Jane wrote to Cassandra about a dinner party after which Brother James and the hostess read Dr. Jenner's pamphlet on the cowpox. Dr. Edward Jenner had observed that dairy maids, having been exposed to the milder virus cowpox had then developed immunity to smallpox. With the doctor's new inoculation, Martha may have discounted any home remedy. I calculate that Martha began her household book in 1796, just four years after Jenner's findings were published. James Austin likely read Jenner's pamphlet with piqued interest since his wife bore the facial scars of the disease. It's a tragic irony that some patients with major illnesses, such as consumption and smallpox, put their trust in useless concoctions. Equally tragic were the patients experiencing only minor, minor maladies who underwent toxic treatments, being completely unaware of any risk. In Jane's lifetime, anyone could self-medicate with calomel from the neighborhood apothecary. Calomel is a form of mercury chloride and was taken initially as a laxative, but eventually it became a panacea for everything from headaches to indigestion. Jane wrote that, that Cassandra Cook, that's her mother's cousin, took calomel instead of following her doctor's treatment plan. Last year I had for some time the sensation of a peck loaf resting on my head, and they talked of cupping me, but I came off with a dose or two of calomel and have never heard of it since. A peck loaf was one of several units of bread. The unit was defined by the pre-bake weight of the loaf. An Oxford newspaper clipping from 1777 specified that a peck loaf weighed 17 pounds, six ounces, even allowing for market changes by 1813 when Mrs. Cook was writing, I'd say she had quite a migraine headache. The practice of cupping involves placing hot glass jars on the skin an effort to improve circulation. Gold medal swimmer Michael Phelps practiced cupping for the 2016 Rio Olympics. The practice was allowable and the cup marks were visible on his skin during competition. For Mrs. Cook, cupping may or may not have relieved the sensation on her head, but the resulting bruises would have been far less harmful than the mercury she ingested in doses of camomile. Two years later, Jane reported that her brother was taking calomel. Henry is not quite well, a bilious attack with fever. He came back early from Henrietta Street yesterday and went to bed. He is calomeling and therefore in a way to be better and I hope may well be tomorrow. Martha's book lists calomel in this cure for worms shown here at the top of the screen. The cure could be administered to a child as young as four years old. Similarly, Jane's young niece Harriet, daughter of Charles, suffered from headaches and was given mercury, probably in liquid form. Jane wrote, now the reports from Keppel Street are rather better. Little Harriet's headaches are abated and Sir Edward is satisfied with the effects of the mercury and does not despair for a cure. Harriet was only seven years old at the time of her mercury treatment. Not until the latter half of the 19th century were calomel and other mercury cures abandoned when they became associated with gangrene, gum deterioration, and tooth loss. Each of the household books featured thus far includes a cure for rabies. In the 18th century, it was believed that rabies was one of the few diseases that could be spread from animals to humans. So it's quite common to find rabies cures in these collections. With rabies, scientists had observed that the time between a person's first symptom and death was usually only three days. So time was of the essence 
and it was imperative for a family to have a remedy on hand. As you can see here in my transcription of Martha's book, the Wigby's cure calls for both simple and complex ingredients. Garlic was used in many savory dishes and the bitter culinary herb rue was found in the typical kitchen garden, which was planted with both cooking and cures in mind. The remedy also includes two ancient and highly complex mixtures. Venice treacle was the common name for Thoriaca andromache, an exotic blend of 64 ingredients, such as roots, leaves, flowers, seeds, resin, and animal parts. These were pulverized, then combined with honey as an antidote for poisonous animal bites. Mithridate was actually the forerunner of Venice treacle. It was used as a universal antidote and safeguard against poisons and disease. The original mixture is attributed to Mithridates VI, a king in ancient Greece. He took the compound in sublethal doses to make himself impervious to poisons. To this day, the practice of taking small doses of poisons to build up a tolerance is called Mithridatism. With both Venice treacle and Mithridate in the rabies cure, you get the impression that people to try, were trying to throw everything they could at the disease. Both of these mixtures were dispensed from apothecaries, and occasionally you can see antique apothecary jars like these for sale in online auctions. Martha's version of the dog bite cure is unique in that it prescribes doses for a dog. The instructions do not specify whether to treat the biting dog or perhaps its canine victim, but Martha and her contemporaries would have assumed to treat only the rabid dog. In a treatise on 18th century rabies, I was surprised to learn that the prevailing belief was that dogs did not generally acquire rabies by being bitten, rather that the disease occurred in these animals spontaneously. Therein lies the problem. Someone must figure out how to treat the mad dog without getting bitten. Oddly enough, I could not find an illustration of someone attempting to medicate a mad dog. But if you look at this drawing and imagine the man's stick replaced with an extremely long handled spoon, I think you get the idea. Sadly, whether a patient had two or four legs, the remedy would have had little effect. With our knowledge of modern medicine, we can categorize many 18th century home remedies as genuinely helpful, downright preposterous, or inadvertently poisonous. Although we cannot fully adopt a mindset from any era other than our own, we might consider the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic to help us understand the fear and uncertainty that accompany diseases in Jane Austen's time. Surely we can empathize with the eagerness any family felt to find an effective cure. Like the Austens, Lloyds, Montagues, and Amblers, we reach for remedies in the hope they will relieve our suffering and in the trust they will do no harm. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Julianne. That was wonderful. Sorry about the techno problems. I'm glad we got that figured out. Um, yeah, so That's, go ahead, Anne. I was just going to say, so delightful. It's really helpful to have all of those words defined and <laughs> to really know what was going into all of those different cures. Can you imagine the medicine cabinet at home if you really stocked up on all these cures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there any chance that white dog turds was not actually literal? Like, I like, don't like, know. Some other substance? Or do you really think it was? No. no, I think it was actually that. Now, actually, I did some I did some Googling on dog poop, and there's a theory that any, any dog's pile will turn white over time. But the thought is that it had consumed a lot of meat and bone, and that could help the patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very Don't try this at home, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that, have you tried any of these recipes yourself? I have not tried any of them. Now, the active <laughs> ingredients in the section 
you can find on some labels, you know, in your kitchen, in your kitchen cabinet or medicine cabinet, mm -hmm. if you go to the drugstore. But no, I have not self-medicated with anything from Martha's book. <laughs> I've tried many of the culinary recipes. Recipes. <laughs> So we uh, would like to remind our audience that you can continue to leave us questions in the chat and we will collect them. And if you do not have a Google account or you do not want to contribute to the chat, you can still email those to us at info at janeaustinandco.org. So let us begin because we've got some great questions to begin with. Um, I feel like this is a really good one to start off with is what can we infer about Martha or her interests by comparing her book to others? How is it similar? How is it different? And I love this uh, little note, you know, Jane Austen does mention her, her knowledge of medicine more than once in her letters. So she's clearly known for this. Right. Well, what, as I said in my talk, Martha's interest was primary, primarily culinary. There are some books that are exclusively culinary, and I will point out Elizabeth Curtis from Curtis Apothecary in Alton. Well, she was married to the apothecary. So funny, she didn't collect one cure because she had her husband right there. Um, other books are primarily medicinal, not only the Amblers, but some others that I've seen um, in the Hampshire Record Office. So uh, it just depends. Some have veterinary cures in them. So what you can infer is that she did not tend a large number of animals, although she does have some animal cures. Um, it, she does not have a large income because when you look at the Knight family cookbook and all the land they have, and all the space they had at Godmersham, there are far more wine recipes, for example, in the Knight family cookbook and more elaborate desserts. So I think you can look at Martha's book and imagine she's pretty squarely middle class as it was emerging in Georgia and Britain, that she had some space because she could cure legs at ham and that takes up some space, but she didn't have as much space as Landy Gentry, like the Knights. So, um, and she was always interested in cooking. Also in Martha's book, it is predominantly Martha's hand. It is predominantly her generation alone. There are a few other hands in Martha's book and they're kind of crammed between the spaces Martha left between entries. And I think those are written after Martha's death. Other household books, you can see many hands throughout it. So the Ambler book goes on for five generations, mm -hmm. as does the Curtis book. It goes on for many generations. So Martha's is unique from my perspective in that it focuses on that time frame and deliciously the time frame that she lived with Jane Austen. So mm -hmm. you can kind of look through Martha's book and see the same names that creep up in Jane's letters. There isn't another household book that is that close to Jane Austen, mm -hmm. which is why we published it. Yeah. Can I follow up? I'm just intrigued by this, um, uh, the fine line between food and medicine mm -hmm. um, and how I hadn't really thought about it before, but how you, I mean, both are grown, as you say, ingredients for both are grown in the kitchen garden. Um, you know, in Austin, there's certainly Mr. Woodhouse treats food as medicine. Um, yes. But I'm, I'm curious, to what extent are there examples of medicine kind of being food? Or, or are there kind of other examples of that um, gray area between the two that you've found in either in Martha's or other um, of these books? Well, you know, there was certainly helpful food, you know, like uh, bread and gruel and things that you would give invalids. So there was food that you would give somebody in particular when they were seeking better health. The ingredients, there are many herbs that you can find in both culinary recipes and medicinal cures. Now, what's different about the cures is what you would buy at the apothecary shop. So, I mean, there is that, that line there. But when you're planting the kitchen garden, you are looking for things that are going to serve your family. So whether or not the lavender is going to be part of a potpourri or is going to be made into lavender water that you would put, you know, soothing on, um, you know, a braised skin. That would be something you'd think of dual purpose. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, Julianne, from 
other times I've either read uh, your stuff or heard you talk, I mean, one of the things I get is that though Martha was, say, collecting all these recipes or whoever the lady was who was collecting, it would not be probably Martha who was doing the actual cooking, right? Um, it would be yes. someone else. So what about the medication? Would this be also something to prepare the these medicines that she would delegate to um, household um, servants, or do we not know that? I don't have any specific examples of that. I would assume that the lady of the house would have a hand in preparing these concoctions, mm -hmm. if, if nothing else, by giving the recipe to the cook. But it's possible because there isn't a lot of cooking involved that she might prepare these concoctions herself. Right. She probably went to the apothecary. Now, if she's got servants and someone else is doing the shopping, she would say, I need this at the apothecary shop. I'm preparing this remedy. And when you come back, could you mix up four doses? Mm -hmm. Now, so, if yeah. the veterinary cure, you're probably going to have the gamekeeper involved and he's going to probably concoct it and administer it to the animal. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm worried about the uh, dog bite, you know, from the rabbit <laughs> dog. Um, do you think that households would keep some of some of the Venice treacle or mithridate around, or would they have to send somebody posting off to the closest apothecary really, really fast? I would think that if you're in town and you've heard of a rabid dog, you're going to stock up. I think mm -hmm. if anyone in the family has seen a rabid dog, you're going to have some of this on hand. If you're living way out in the country, you may have it on hand. You may just as well have, have the shotgun and not, not mess with treating the rabid dog. So I think I have not heard of whether or not people have all of this on hand. All I know is that these ingredients were common in the apothecary shop. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have a great question about the global influence of medicine, specifically of mm. any cures that might have been influenced by African or Caribbean enslaved people that would have made their way to England. I have not noticed it in the books that I have looked at, but I also have not been looking for that. So I do not know the answer to that. That is a great question. And I think I want to go back to some of my sources. Um, I know that some of the roots could have come from South America, for example, um, and they made their way to Europe through Jesuit priests. Now, whether or not they were products or of enslaved people or, or missionaries, you know, I, I don't have that detail. Certainly, you're going to get sugar and tea as products from those institutions. More broadly, then, what about um, other areas of the world? Was there evidence that, you know, uh, English people in this period were looking to certain regions or certain uh, botanicals or certain traditions that were influencing their practice? You know, I think there's evidence of some of these ingredients coming from all around the globe. Um, but some of them are also available in the typical kitchen garden. So, you know, I think you're going to have widespread sourcing on these materials. You're also in some of the, the household preparations, you're going to have spermaceti and that comes from sperm whales. So, you know, you're going to get that from the colonies, probably from New England. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, here's an off the wall um, twist on this. Do you, um, have you heard of uh, Kathleen Finn, Flynn's The Jane Austen Project? Yes, I have. I, I think that it's an interesting kind of response to your talk in a way. I mean, uh, you know, she wrote it before your talk, but, but maybe she read some of your work prior, but the idea of modern doctors going back in time to give Jane Austen better medicine <laughs> she had access to and and thereby prolonging her life is you know it's a different response to the same kind of anxiety and um uh you know lack of control that you were describing people feeling um in the you know when 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 encountering diseases that they don't know how to cure 
Mm -hmm. I, I think you want to take some sort of step. And if you heard that someone used something and got better, and if it didn't kill them, then you're going to try it for your loved one. Mm -hmm. If you got better with a little bit of calomel, who's to say? I, I wouldn't, I'd rather do the cupping, but you know, as long as someone didn't die immediately from it, you know, there, were, there weren't long-term scientific studies to say over time there's gangrene and tooth loss only eventually in the late, late 1800s did they discover that. Yeah, they well, were mostly dealing with ends of one from everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Susan. I was just gonna say when I was in high school, it was very common in a chemistry class for the teacher to bring in some mercury and you know, put it on the table and we would all play with it. You wouldn't do that now, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you can see how these things are really, you know, changing or our knowledge about the, the um, downsides of these things. Absolutely. You know, it, and hopefully there'll be some day when, when chemo is looked at as barbaric because we've gone so far beyond it. Mm -hmm. But right now you need to suppress certain things in the body to suppress the cancer right. you know and perhaps the medications back then did the same thing yeah it's surviving, yeah surviving the cure was was something mm -hmm. is to be to be done then as it is sometimes now mm -hmm. um we have a, an interesting question here whoops i was just gonna hit the show yes about the um well now it's not happening but the, the question is, here it is, um, about the, the moon phases. Um, and I think it's really a question about what, um, about how uh, folk remedies seem to work into these cures that, that um, Martha and others were collecting. So um, do you think that the moon phase reference for, this was for the goiter um, recipe, uh, implies participation in a tradition of lunar magic, or was it just, you know, a, a period of time reference, or I mean, what do you make of that? In this particular recipe, to me, it's time frame. However, mm -hmm. I have seen recipes that sound like they're right out of, you know, folklore. So mm -hmm. I think if you look at a period of household books going back hundreds of years, you might see some transition from folklore to somewhat early stages of medicine mm -hmm. and then later on medicine. So mm -hmm. I think it's possible that some of these folk cures or home remedies do have some, some folk in them. But mm -hmm. the particular cure of Martha's, it seems to me to be more timing. So mm -hmm. when you've done this over a month, it takes a month to get through all of this. Well, in that same line, I was wondering about the, the consumption um, re recipe. Um, why the first of the new milk? Is there a difference in what comes out of the cow in the first stream than comes out later? Or is this just, we want it to be fresh, fresh, fresh? I think the idea is fresh. Um, I don't have any any research on that but it seems to me it's like the new grasses is to get mm -hmm. everything at its peak so mm -hmm. you know you want everything when it's new and fresh and has the highest nutrition possible you know it could be that the milk has been sitting around for a while at the house you know so i think you want to get just the freshest and best i don't mm -hmm. have any document documentation about why particularly new milk versus old milk mm -hmm. thanks sure I have a question about uh, what happened to her book. As you brought up yourself, right, it was very common for these books to be passed down through generations and for us to see multiple hands. But this one, right, is just the one generation. So what is the provenance of this book? Who is it passed down to? And uh, how does it how is it still around today? Sure. I'm glad you asked that. Martha's book, thank goodness, was saved by relatives. So after Martha died, um, Martha married Frank in both of their later years. Um, and after Martha's death, as I said, another hand wrote in the book. And my hunch is that it's probably Frances Sophia because she was still living at the house when Martha died. It was passed down to, through, to Rosemary Mowell. 
And that was a descendant from one of Frank's children. And she eventually sold the book to Jane Austen's house because she was trying to sell artifacts to fund her daughter's education. So she so, kept it within the family. Mm -hmm. But it still got passed down, which I think is, is wonderful and saved by her family. Yes. It, and yes. my own institution's collection, we, ha we have some of those books, right? They get passed down and you see so many generations from the, the 17th century on often leaving yeah. their mark. So, you know, what's so difficult is that, you know, occasionally someone will share with me a household book and they'll wonder, you know, if it's valuable. And I'm certainly, you know, I certainly don't participate in auctions and I can't put a dollar amount on anything. But I can look at a book and tell you whether or not I've seen the cures other places. And it is interesting that a number of cures in Martha's book, as well as in other books, can be traced to some printed sources. So clearly women are writing down information that they see in books. Well, of course you would because you want to save this recipe or save this cure. Other times you've been getting it from somebody within the family or an acquaintance. And again, back to Martha's book, it is the only book that I've seen that is that closely tied to Jane Austen. There is another, um, there are a couple more books in the, the Austen Knight family. There's of course the Knight family cookbook, but again, it's not as close to Jane. The, uh, Jane's cousin also has a household book, again, with remedies and recipes. Again, it's not as close the, is to Jane Austen. There aren't recipes that are mentioned in Jane's letters and in her novels. So that's the one unique selling proposition to Martha's book. And we are very grateful that it has been saved and very grateful that it's been published. I actually saw the book. Um, my first in-person experience with it was in 2012. And I told the director of the house that it really needs to be published. And you know, it was only through time and the bodily and doing an exhibition on Jane Austen's, the anniversary of her death, that um, bodily and became interested in it. And then we did the proposal and they were happy to publish it. So, you know, it just takes the right time and the right publisher, but I, I'm very grateful that we were able to transcribe it and get it out there for the world. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, another great question from Rose Kearns. Um, how, if at all, has this research influenced your readings of doctors and self-doctors um, in Austin's own novels? Uh, <laughs> I know Rose, hello Rose. You know, um, I think, you know, I think it's interesting to, uh, to look at some of the cures, like the bloodletting, the lavender water, you know, and realize that they are trying everything. I don't look at these cures as, well, oh, a lot of that, that good that'll do, because they didn't know as much as we know. So it's really unfair to look back with what we call presentism, presentism the lens of today looking back on the past. But I see them trying, and I see the doctors trying and doing what they can. So it's just a period in the timeline, and they're using the resources they have available. I guess sympathetic would be my view of them. <laughs> Not critical. I think they're doing the best they can. These these aren't really questions, but they're they're interesting tidbits that respond oh, good, to this. Good. Um, one is uh, let's see, where did it go? Um, Allison Thompson says that she thinks the butter content of the first squirts of milk might be higher. Uh, and so that's that's an interesting possibility um, to why you might want to, especially somebody who's who's fading from consumption, I suppose. <laughs> you know, you could could be. So, um, could be. And then let's see, um, someone else, Nan says, in the fifties, and this was true in the sixties as well. Um, my, uh, her mother kept merthiolate and mercurochrome to paint on scrapes and scratches, which had mercury in it. So, yes. I mean, we were apparently still using it and we've survived till today at least. So that's- Absolutely. I had plenty of cuts with mercurochrome. I can still see the little applicator in the little bottle coming out. Mm -hmm. I like how it dyed my skin red. 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, finally, here's another one about dog turds, which everybody seems okay. very um, intrigued by. <laughs> um, Susan Purcell says that uh, one of the most effective remedies for illness um, is to fix uh, to fix a person's microbiome by inserting a treated turd from a healthy person. So maybe they were onto something. Yeah, that's a big deal right <laughs> wow. now. Yes. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's going to sign up for the field study on that one. Well, <laughs> I, I think, uh, Julianne, you need to start testing out some of these home remedies. <laughs> like, Martha, like Martha, I'm mostly culinary. But I think <laughs> it's good to have the perspective of the lady of the house. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, going through these recipes when we were transcribing the book, it was the handwriting, of course, is difficult. You get used to it over time. But researching these compounds and roots it's, and tree bark, et cetera, was a real adventure. And when you look at the whole book, although Martha's book is 75% recipes, culinary recipes, and 25% medicinal home, home preparations, et cetera, the major, almost about 40% of the footnotes are on the medicinal part. You know, it takes more to explain all those ingredients and mm -hmm. where they come from. Mm -hmm. And probably because I have not made these cures, nor would I, that I'm not as familiar, that I can't just tell you rattle off the ingredients like I can on the culinary side, because I have made a lot of those recipes in Martha's book and a good number from the Knight Family Cookbook. So there's something about creating them that really embeds them in your memory. But some of these compounds, I, I do have to research and, and keep a list of what's toxic. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Anne. We have a question about whether or not in this time period there might have been uh, a, any beliefs related to the spiritual causes of illness in this period. Was all illness uh, considered to be curable through these types of medicine, or did people have other superstitions and beliefs? I haven't come across them through household books, but know that I have been working through the lens of the household book. So someone capturing remedies is probably not as likely to write down other types of things in these books. So my experience with cures overall starts with what's in the household book. So I don't have the frame of reference to do, to do justice to that question. It's a really good one. Um, someone here pointed out uh, who did a, this is another one of these little tid tidbits that are so fun. Um, so Rosary M. Pet says that she did a research paper for a biology class about Dr. Jenner. Um, Edward Jenner, and that he got the idea of vaccination from a slave, and it was called variolation. Could be. Yeah, could be. Could be a, a thread to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could very well be. You can see how, um, just as our audience has varying degrees of knowledge, the woman writing the household book would have varying degrees as well. So you can imagine Elizabeth Ambler gathering what she did for her, her ill relatives mm -hmm. could probably, you know, cure a lot more or at least go to more cures than Martha could. Mm -hmm. Whereas Martha could probably cook her under the table. Well, not literally, but, you know, she could, she could order the food and she would know how the kitchen should be stocked and how the shopping would be done. You, you tend to create what you need. So you're stocking your own pantry, whether it's, whether it's culinary or medicinal. And a lot of these household books, too, contained recipes for other household tasks as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. You could have a wash for walls. You could have blacking for shoes. Um, one of my favorites is that there's an ink recipe in Martha's book. And I really would like to have some scientific study done on some of the ink in Jane's letters to see if it matches the recipe in Martha's book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think it would. She, you know, she lived in the cottage when Jane was writing 
three of those novels. So why wouldn't the ant be one Martha's recipe prepared? I don't know. That is an intriguing question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know that anyone's going to let me have a letter to do a little experimentation with, but maybe somebody, somebody would lend one to a laboratory to at least examine. Yeah. I don't know. So um, going back to your comparison of the Knight family cookbook and Martha's, um, did you, what, are there differences between the kind of cures in, in, or recipes for cures in each? Um. You're going to find mostly culinary in the Knight Family Cookbook. In fact, I went back and looked and there isn't a pure cure in those in the Knight Family Cookbook. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one that I throw in as an example simply because that salad dressing recipe, recipe for tolu balsam syrup, it can yeah. be used either way. But I don't see cures in that book. I see recipes. So I don't know if they had another book or because they were a family of means that they always just called the local doctor. I, I really don't know. I mean, we call it the Knight Family Cookbook. Um, and I believe the inscription on the front refers to this book, but I don't think it calls it a cookbook or a recipe book. I think it just says this book. So, but no, I don't find cures in it at all. I see mm -hmm. different that tell me that they're a family of means and that whoever is preparing these has some space that Martha doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. Um, great variety in that book. And it's their size too. There's twice the recipes of Martha's. So um, it's intriguing in its own right. Mm -hmm. But Martha gets the, the prize for humble, humble recipes in proximity to Jane. Well, that's another question now that you say that. Um, what... What's the most intriguing book for you that you've looked at? I mean, maybe take away the Jane Austen connection and just, I mean, do you have a, a kind of sense of, of how these differ and what, what kind of features are very interesting in them? Well, taking away Martha's it is difficult. You're taking away my favorite toy, Susan. Um, um, sorry. But that, you know, that oh. is a Taking away the reason for, I mean, the Jane Austen connection, I guess. Is right, right, right. Well, Martha's book is, is again, my interests are primary culin primarily culinary. So I do mm -hmm. enjoy that. Um, I also enjoy the Montague book for the culinary information. Um, there's another family, uh, and their household book is in the Hampshire Record Office. And Oh, Gervais, uh, they're from Harriet. Um, and their name appears in the ledger books uh, from uh, from the Knight family. So they're tenants eventually. But their book is interesting to me because it is older than Martha's book. It spans more generations. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it is originally a ledger book. And the recipes go right over the columns for shillings, and pounds, shillings, and pence. So, you know, you use any book that's, at hand, but originally a household book would have been kind of something for keeping the household accounts, and then it evolved into this. Oh, that's so, interesting. They, they that also interesting. Are, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, was, that's, I was going to ask that actually in terms of like how they were bound, you know. Um, so that's one idea is taking an existing book yes. like a ledger book. What about the others? How were they? How were they bound? Were they? Did people have sure. the funds to self-publish, you know, or how is it done? They're not, I have not found one that has, that has really elaborate binding. They've got something on the cover. So Martha's has um, a calfskin cover. Um, and uh, the one in here is the Gervois family of Harriet. Their book is about the size of Martha's and then it's much thicker. It has actually a leather cover and a little latch on it with a little lock. It almost looks like a diary lock, you know, from the 50s. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. But most of these were not very elaborate at all. Mm -hmm. So I think because the Gervois family book started as a ledger book is why it looks very much like the account books from Edward Knight. It has the same kind of closure that, that fits in, almost like a little lock. So I think that's why those two look very similar. Edward's are much larger 
with bigger columns and bigger pages, but the closure is the same. And I think that's for that same reason. Otherwise, and I think that's probably why we don't have tons of these. We have a number of them. Now, the Knight family book, I do not know how it is bound. Uh, what I was privileged to see was um, there were 13 copies printed and leather bound. Sandy Lerner arranged for those and she lent me her copy. But I have not seen how the original is bound. I'd like to see that someday. Hint, hint, anyone from Trotman who's listening. <laughs> so, so next year. People were actually asking which which of these books are available, you know, for so if, unless we're very fortunate to find one of those 13, can we read Elizabeth Ambler's book or, you know, in addition to the, your lovely edition of Martha's, which Thank other you. ones? There are portions of Elizabeth Ambler's book in print and, uh, but not the entire book. And let me see if I can get you the source information on that. Uh, that one is called Lavender Water and Snail Syrup. So if you look at that title, you'll see Miss Ambler's Household Book of Georgian Cures and Remedies. That was published in 2013. And of course, Martha's book was, which I transcribed it and the Bodleian printed that one in 2021. The Knight Family Cookbook you can get, let's see, here is that. I have that one here. Okay. And okay. yep. And that one is a facsimile edition. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to transcribe that and annotate it if someone from Chotney is listening. Is listening. <laughs> um, the handwriting in that is, is not too difficult to read. Martha's can be challenging. Um, partly because of the handwriting, also because you can tell when her quill needed to be mended and it was absorbing too much ink and depositing on the page. Mm -hmm. So we saw that cure for the black draft, the lines from the recipe on the back side of the page are bleeding through to the recipe mm -hmm. you're trying to read. And, and it can be a real challenge. Um, but luckily we have very good scans of it. I had that for the transcription, so that helped quite a bit. Maybe we Did can share some, some of those. Sorry, maybe we can share some of those in the in the chat or um, later to our on our uh, with our followers. Did you not also say, Julianne, that um, some of these books, maybe Martha's have spatters from the kitchen? Um, it doesn't look like the Knight family book does. That's very pristine looking. Yeah, Christine is exactly the word I used to describe it. But then again, I was holding um, a printed copy and I, I don't think that the original has seen much action. The common practice uh, at a large estate like, like uh, Godmersham would be for the lady of the house to copy out the recipe and hand it to a servant mm -hmm. or directly to the cook. Mm -hmm. Martha's book looks like it's been in the kitchen. now. From the splatters and the crumbling and well-worn pages, I, I don't know what's on it, if it's sauce. Um, I don't know if it was done by later generations as it was passed mm -hmm. down and perhaps used. I don't know if some of the splatters date you know, to Martha's time. Maybe she handed it to the cook um, at Gosport when she was living, you know, when she was married to Frank. I, I really don't know, but that's another thing that would be interesting to analyze. Just out of curiosity, I mean, it doesn't really change the fact that it's closely tied to Jane, um, but it, it, it is curious. We have a great question here about, uh, did household books ever refer to recipes related to things like treating menstrual cramps, morning sickness, contraception, or other of these perhaps uh, female-centered diseases? <laughs> you know, I hate it, it could very well be uh, the Ambler book that I think it's the Ambler book. I have seen uh, treatments for menstrual cramps and I cannot tell you what the cure was, um, but I have seen that. Um, I haven't seen anything from contraception. I have seen, I have seen um, cures that are to, um, induce miscarriages. I have seen that. So there, there are female issues covered in these cures. Mm -hmm. 
And we have a great comment here too. Um, back on this idea of the first milk for breastfeeding mothers, the first milk is the most nutritious. So maybe it's following off of that wisdom as well. Could very well be, could very well be. Boy, and I guess you're out of luck, you know, if that's all you have is something from last week, you know, I don't know, I really don't know. I, I think all of these, for me, I, I go to the, right to the person who's got the, the responsibility for curing somebody and, and they're gonna try and get the best. And I'll bet if it didn't even say new milk, you're still gonna try and get something pretty fresh. Mm -hmm. you just, and you're gonna throw everything you can at it. There's really no reason to have both Ven Venice treacle and Mithridate. My gosh, they're almost the same. But, you know, again, here, try this. Well, the more the better, perhaps, you know, especially yeah. if it's if it's for a rabies cure. <laughs> yeah. The rabies yes. thing that surprised me the most was the, the, the theory then that dogs, this happened spontaneously in them that they didn't get it from being bitten by another dog or, you know, in the middle of Kansas, you think it might be a raccoon or something, you know, there, there, there are bats that carry rabies, but the fact that it would occur spontaneously in the animal is just, that's very surprising to me, but that's the information they had. So it would make sense that you're going to try and cure the dog. I just, I don't want to be the one who drew the short straw and have to go give them the little spoonful of medicine. Well, the very long spoonful of medicine. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just put it outside, you know, a pork chop and then hand it to the dog. Well, thank you so much, Julianne, for joining us tonight. I certainly learned a lot. I do not think I will be reaching for the Mythodratis anytime soon, but <laughs> this was just a fascinating Talk. And we'd like to thank everyone who came out tonight. Mm -hmm. This is our final talk for this season. Cool. We are breaking for the summer, but we will be back in fall after our hiatus. Uh, you can stay connected, though, with Jane Austen and company and the Jane Austen Summer Program through our websites. You know, as always, you can come see us at uh, janeaustenandco.org or find out uh, more about what's in store for the Jane Austen Summer Program through janeaustensummer.org. Yeah, and we really, uh, we would wish that, uh, Julianne, you'll sometime join us at the Jane Austen Summer Program as well. All, all the rest of us will be there. Mm -hmm. And um, this program was supported in part by the North Carolina Humanities, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we would also like to thank UNC's uh, Humanities for the Public Good for their um, contribution, a project of the College of Arts and Sciences with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And we'd like to thank everyone who over the course of both Everyday Science in the Regency and Reading with Jane Austen donated to our series. Uh, we just appreciate you guys so much and it allows us to bring wonderful speakers like Julianne Gehrer here and to keep these events free. So thank you again. We'll miss you over the summer, but we hope you guys have a wonderful summer holiday. Yeah, and thank you again, Julianne. It was really great. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you for asking. All best wishes. Stay healthy, everyone.